So I saw Amadeus at the Royal Albert Hall. It was the theatrical version. Well, not the theatrical version. It was the director's cut edited into the theatrical version. I know this because the title sequence looked like this. Rather than maybe this. Now when I watched the movie this time around, seeing the subtitles for the first time actually made me realise something I never managed to process until now, and it actually has ruined my interpretation of one of the scenes, so I'm just going to go over that now. Salieri says this. Oh, Wolfgang had actually summoned up his own father to accuse his son before all the world. See, I didn't process that line, so I was under the impression that Salieri was suggesting that Mozart was portraying his father as Don Giovanni and the dark statue as death and the punishment for his sins. But I admit, I was never 100% confident on that. And now that I've realized I was wrong, it makes a lot more sense. And now I feel stupid because the parallels between the dark statue and the costume obviously tell us that the dark figure is supposed to be the father. And while I did recognize that the dark figure and the costume are supposed to be the same thing, I obviously didn't make the full connection. But yeah, the fact that Don Giovanni represents Mozart shines a completely new light on the concept. Now it seems that Mozart feels guilty and responsible for his father's death, or at least just not being by his side when he died. This opera was created as a true tribute to his father, which is something I said, but I guess that is all it is, as my other interpretation just doesn't seem to be the case. Now this dark figure who continues to show up at his door reminds him of his father, a father who wants to kill him, like the statue to Don Giovanni. I guess that's all I can say about that really. Okay, last issue before we get back into the movie. I'm going to talk about my opinions on the theatrical version since I technically saw it at the Royal Albert Hall. So if you've only ever seen the director's cut, essentially the director's cut has a lot of scheming, whereas in the theatrical version, Salieri basically only has one scheme, two if you count the ballet scenes. But it's not a huge scheme. People who say the theatrical version is the superior version are people on the side of, this version shows much more of a glimmer of humanity and relatability to Salieri, and they can empathise with him a lot more. I definitely think the theatrical version does this. It paints Salieri with a slightly lighter brush, at least towards the beginning. And while I do somewhat agree with that, I don't agree entirely. I still think the theatrical version paints Salieri as evil. On the other hand, I think with the added scenes in the director's cut, we as viewers are still able to empathize with Salieri at least on a pitying level. It's sad that he was being driven to evil. We are aware of what he wants in life and the fact that his goal is so unreachable, remember, unfulfillable longing. I actually think that the fact that he does all those mean things makes it harder for us as viewers to be on his side, yet we can still empathize with him because we understand that his shortcomings have driven him to do these bad things. I think that's quite complex and I would compare it to the confusing morality of A Clockwork Orange or the Saw franchise. But yeah, that's just my opinion. But that's not all. There's a few things the director's cut includes that gives the movie a stronger effect. I've already explained this for some of them, but having seen exactly what scenes were cut, I now have more to say. For instance, the beginning of this scene with Constanza is cut. We don't get to see Salieri interact with this opera singer and even much of the servant. We see Salieri simply living his life, enjoying and appreciating music, sprinkled in with his dessert obsession and what that means in terms of his love life. And I believe this shot and this shot are supposed to be connected. I just like the scene to exist as a world and character building thing. It's nice. We must also mention the entire storyline with the dog man is gone. I think that mini story adds so much to the story. It shows us Mozart's interactions with the people he works for. It shows us how little disturbances could have led to his drinking problem. And it also highlights how depressing Mozart's situation is when he comes crawling back to this man he once despised, begging for some money. It contrasts so well with the way Mozart was before, chirpy, confident, and somewhat spoilt and impatient. The other thing that was cut was this line in this scene here. Show this woman out. Which I don't want to spoil yet, but that line basically gets called back towards the end of the film, and you wouldn't get the relevance of that line in just a the theatrical version. So yeah, anyway, you can prefer the theatrical version if you want, but I don't know man, I simply disagree. Like, <laughs> And so now we begin the final part of my analysis. Mozart is taken to bed. I feel like Salieri holding the lantern symbolizes Mozart's current view of Salieri as a kind of friend and a savior. He even leaves the room then comes back with the candelabra, which makes me think back to this shot. This low-key lighting setting the mood as very dark and sad. Yet Salieri carries light. It's as if the cinematography is gaslighting us into thinking Salieri is Mozart's friend. At the same time, I actually don't think that Salieri would like Mozart dead. It really does seem like Salieri is feeling bad about this, whether or not he was poisoning Mozart's medicine. Salieri's face to me screams, I know this plan is coming to fruition, but I'm still starting to feel bad about it now that it's truly a reality. It all comes down to F. Murray Abraham's performance, so nuanced, so complex, layered, and you as a viewer are unsure what to think of him, but also quite certain you know how he feels. 
The candelabra even stops in front of Mozart in this shot. This could be a way of foreshadowing to us the evil of Salieri, that he is essentially this close to killing him. It would be as easy as setting him on fire, sort of thing. But we could also see it as another juxtapositioning, keeping that metaphor of light representing hope, loyalty and friendship. It's as if he could be here to help Mozart due to his fake kindness. When Salieri asks, where is your wife? Mozart lies and says she's not well. Another lie to cover up their recent relationship issues. And I can't tell if Salieri believes this or not, but in terms of what's been shown in the film, there is no way for Salieri to know whether Constanza is just sick or if she's left him. But Salieri probably has his suspicions. Still, I think whatever he thinks, the fact that she is gone does put Salieri in a false sense of security, which allows him to do the things he ends up doing in these upcoming scenes. Mozart and Salieri have this sweet exchanging of words. Mozart. Mozart, I would never miss anything you had written. It's just a far to fill. No, no. It's a sublime piece. <laughs> the grandest of it all, me. I tell you, you are the greatest composer known to me. I think despite all the bad things Salieri did, the fact that he is able to admit how amazing Mozart's music is does feel super genuine, and for a moment it really feels like we are seeing a small glimmer of humanity in Salieri. He really does believe the things he is saying, and I've kind of liked this complex manipulating of our emotions as viewers through this dialogue. And when Salieri says this line, greatest composer known to me, we can see the jealousy in his eyes, something I feel that we can relate to, having followed his story, yes, even through his evil schemes. This envy is something many people can relate to, having someone in your life who just manages to do something a lot better than you, it can be heartbreaking, especially if you have a deep passion for that thing and put a lot of effort into it. Meanwhile, they seem to be doing the bare minimum and manage to create amazing art. There's a loud knocking at the door. Mozart asks him to ask the man, who he thinks is the Requiem Commissioner, to give him some money. This distant shot with this almost chiaroscuro style lighting is yet another way the cinematography is portraying to us Salieri's untrustworthiness. It's Shikanido. Salieri. Give him this. That's his share. That should cheer him up. Indeed. And now good night to you all. It was perfection, truly. I love how Salieri drops the money on Mozart as if he's some sort of peasant that needs to crawl around for his money. Salieri uses Mozart's assumption to his advantage, relying on his own message to Mozart as if the dark figure was just at the door with the message. Mozart then asks Salieri to help him finish his requiem. And on that note, we see Constanza with another man at a ball. It's really cool how she starts to feel regret at the same time that Mozart asks Salieri for this favour. It's like she subconsciously senses something wrong. It could also be that God had sent her a signal to come back home. Not that I'm discrediting her own intentions as well. Of course she feels natural regret for having left Mozart when he clearly was having some bad issues concerning his mental health and addictions. We cut back to Mozart and Salieri writing the Requiem together. It's rather wholesome how Mozart's passion livens him up for this scene. Despite how sick he is, it goes to show how impactful music is in his life. And that's all. No, no, not for the real fire. Mozart asks Salieri to write the words, consigned to flames of woe, a phrase highlighting the pain of hell. If we look back at Mass in C minor, this song has the lyrics, God have mercy on me, as it seems to be a piece all about being taken to hell, but pleading to God to send you to heaven. Now there is no going back. Both Salieri and Mozart seem to be embracing and giving in to the concept of being in hell. And so this thing that Mozart is writing reflects his own feelings, but also Salieri's, but that perhaps they both feel that in writing this piece, they will gain something good from it. Of course Salieri hates God and plans to take credit for this requiem since he believes he deserves that sort of talent and resents God's decision to give talent to the wrong person as opposed to the once most religious and God-loving man. And Salieri momentarily realises that what he's doing will surely end up with him going to hell, but he decides to deflect that moment of truth by insisting that they begin their work. You believe in it? What? Fire which never dies, burning you forever. Oh yes. Possible. Come, let's begin. So these words translate to something along the lines of, while the wicked are confounded, doomed to flames of woe unbounded, call me with thy saints surrounded. There are multiple different translations, but I'm gonna pay attention to this translation. I may be wrong as I'm not the best at interpreting poetry, but to me, this sounds like a dying person calling out to God, afraid of the fires of hell, begging to be taken to heaven, to be forgiven for all his sins, which is pretty much the same concept that Mass in is saying. It's a piece about confronting death and awaiting the unknown eternal life beyond. 
something both Mozart and Salieri are deeply afraid of for their own reasons. This is the both of them coming together and relating on a deeply horrifying concept, Mozart having to express his innermost feelings and vulnerabilities and anxieties, while Salieri having to dictate a genius's work, prepared to steal the work and use it as his own, since he couldn't do it himself. He feels as though it must be done, but is still horrified that it has come to this. We ended in F major. Yes. So now, A minor. A minor. So apparently when Tom Hulse took a step back, and said A minor, it was because he had forgotten his lines. Tom Hulse said he purposefully left things out to confuse F. Murray Abraham, giving a very real reaction. There's one sequence early on in the scene where M Mozart is fairly delirious and trying to find the phrase that he's looking for in the dictation. Confutatis, A minor. In reality, what happened on that day is there's a there's a little um, uh, John Strauss is sitting in the corner pressing the buttons on a little cassette player. We have uh, little hearing aids in our ears which are playing in a kind of AM radio way. The musical phrase so that we can be on the tempo and on the pitch that when all the music gets laid in afterwards that it's there. And there was some mishap so there's a moment where I'm me, the actor, is uh, I'm genuinely lost, but because of the kind of of trust and and uh, uh, connection that we have, the whole sequence is in the film. A minor, and most of that is improvisational because he was very, very acting as though he were very sick at the time, and consequently he began to lose certain things. And I would guide him actually later on in the scene. Um, I don't know that I ever talked to Murray about this, but I would skip information. First bassoon, tenor trombones, with the tenors. I would leave out information that I knew he needed to go to the next place. Don't go too fast. Do you have it? Go too fast. Do you have it? First bassoon, tenor trombone, what? With the tenors. So he'd have to stop me, and that Salieri would seem like he just wasn't quite smart enough. Now, trumpets and timpani, no. trumpets and D. No, no. T listen no, to me. I don't understand. Listen. So that kind of playing that you can do because there were cameras on both of us and also because of a superb partnership between two players. We can then see Salieri really losing track of what's happening, losing focus, feeling like Mozart's clear instructions suddenly sound like gibberish. This dynamic between them shows the loyalty they have for each other, for Salieri's part, his fake loyalty. But this strange bond the two are developing here through their mutual love of music is really what drives this scene and makes it entertaining. Another thing we can notice about this scene is that it's something that relates a lot back to this motif of treating the score as if it's the character's inner dialogue. Strings in unison, ostinato on A, like this. Next measure is rising. Do you have yes, it? Yes, yes, Show I think me. so. It's wonderful. Yes, 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 yes. Simultaneously, Mozart has been scoring his own movie, a way to tell us that this could be his fault. Either that, or he is so vulnerable to evil that he allows himself to draw his own fate. In this case, they are both scoring Mozart's death. The Requiem is killing him, and Salieri is holding the pen. Mozart is both scared of this music, yet thrilled by how amazing it is, that he is blind to the danger coming his way. I also feel like when Salieri gets confused, it's as if he is becoming fully aware of this plan, realizing that it's such a disgusting thing to do, a crime of music. It could be suggesting that he's also regretting this plan too. He is suddenly finding it hard to do what he set out to do, but that might be a bit of a stretch in this analysis. Still good to point out though. Oh, what? this is unscript unscripted right now. This is another thing I need to point out, is that apparently people say that Salieri poisoned Mozart with Aquatofana. Now, Aquatofana in the 1700s in Italy was being used by women to kill their husbands. Ah. Okay, look, look more into that yourself, whatever. Then writing that section as the proofreading begins. Good, show me the whole thing from the beginning. We cut to a carriage, and we hear the completed Requiem piece. 
Constanza is in the carriage on her way home back to Mozart, but I love how this dark imagery of the carriage makes us think about the carriage Mozart was in when he fainted, and also the carriage we see right at the beginning. Something about it looks like death, since the death is coming soon. This shot is so heartbreaking, foreshadowing the sadness she is soon to feel, her child asleep, blind to any of the worries Constanza feels. It's as if their personal issues have been kept kind of a secret from their child. It's morning, and Mozart looks the worst he's ever looked. Salieri still ready to write. I feel like Constanza wearing blue ties into this fact that it's daytime now, and also ties into God's overall power in this climax. She's returning home to protect Mozart from Salieri. She's been brought home by God. Blue can also represent innocence, the way she's just so happy to see Mozart again, not seeming to be worried that he may die. She didn't even know he's been sick. She knows he's had a drinking problem that was getting worse, and she knows Mozart thinks the Requiem is killing him. I think those things floated around her mind back at this scene. She notices a man sleeping. When she sees it Salieri, she is horrified. And had we only seen the theatrical cut, the effect of this scene would have not had a big enough impact on us as viewers. We know that this scene has been playing in the back of our minds since this is the first time Salieri has come face to face with Constanza since the incident. What are you doing here? <coughs> your, your husband took, took sick. I brought him home. Why you? Because, madame, I was at hand. Well, thank you very much. You can go now. Constanza is aware of how much Salieri admires Mozart's music, so her suspicions must be running rampant. The split lighting on Salieri makes his two-faced ways clear to Constanza as well. Just go, please. He asked me to stay. And I'm asking... The medium close-up is intimate. We've gone back to the shot sizes we used to see when we first saw them together. Also, she's wearing blue again. All the love she used to feel for him has come back. She sees the sheet music near Mozart. Having come to the agreement that the Requiem is indeed killing him, she becomes disappointed that he's been working on it again. No, Wolfie, not this. Not this. You're not to work on this ever again. I've decided. This is not his handwriting. Oh, it's mine. I was assisting him. Well, he's not to work on this anymore. It's making him ill. But, but... And that's it. Constanza locks the Requiem away. Salieri now has no opportunity to take credit for him. All God's plan. And that's when we get this line. I regret we have no servants to show you out, Herr Salieri which, as I said, is a callback to this scene in the director's cut. Show this woman out. It felt so out of place when I saw it in the theatrical cut because it's not in reference to anyone. Please respect my wish and go. Madame, I will respect his. Wolfie? Wolfie? I already said this, but I just want to double down on the fact that it's now morning. We've only been seeing night scenes. It's the darkness coming to get Mozart. Now there is light. It's now time for Mozart to die. It's also a way of conveying a kind of clarity. Clarity for Salieri as he realizes now he won't get away with his scheme. Since Constanza and God can both see who he truly is. And it's clarity for Mozart as he honestly seems like he knows he's gonna die soon. He's just happy to be spending his last moments with his wife and child. It's also a kind of blow to Salieri the fact that God has given Mozart a rather wholesome last moment. It's actually quite comical how all of this culminated in such a simple but so effective action, such as locking the sheet music in the cabinet. Now obviously Salieri could burst the cabinet door open and steal the sheet music, but in that case it would have been known to Constanza and therefore everyone in the public space that Salieri has stolen Mozart's work. He knows there is nothing he can do now but leave. And with that over and done with, we get the dreaded moment. Wolfie?
I've seen this film so many times, but in my more recent viewings, including when I saw it at the Royal Albert Hall, I've actually started crying about Mozart's death, and it continued through this funeral scene I'm about to go over. Whether Mozart was poisoned or not, he was gone too early, but I'll touch on how devastating his death is and was later. We'll stop for a moment, then we'll finish the lacrimosa. Notice how he said we will work on the lacrimosa, and now the lacrimosa is playing during this scene. Now, Mozart's student Franz Sava or Zeva Sussmeyer completed the Requiem, and it's pretty hard to do research to find exactly where Mozart's original work stopped and Franz's work started. It's safe to assume that the last thing Mozart was ever able to compose was the Lacrimosa. It's obviously a great choice of music as everyone knows it today, it's incredibly sad, and the context that this is his final piece of music makes it all the more emotional during this scene. We start by seeing Mozart's coffin being put into a carriage, once again a carriage having always represented death since the beginning. Obviously it's not the same carriage, this is some sort of hearse carriage, but it's still a carriage, the first thing we see in the film, the thing we see Mozart and Constanza leave just as the maid is about to proceed with the most intrusive element of Salieri's scheme. We even see one in this scene when Mozart had just been commissioned to write his death mass, and we see it here after Mozart had fainted. People Mozart has had small relationships or acquaintanceships with are gathered in this spot as Mozart's coffin is taken away. Notice how we see Baron von Sweeten, but not Count Orsini Rosenberg or Kapellmeister Bono. I think this readdresses the fondness van Sweeten had for Mozart. Still, the fact that he isn't there shows Orsini never cared about Mozart and only cared about the arts and the maintenance of the Emperor's duties or whatever. We can see that throughout the movie, Van Sweeten had lost some manner of respect for Mozart, but that he'd clearly been feeling sorry for him throughout this whole story. So to see him here at this funeral just confirms to us his concern for Mozart. He does even seem to be the first person to mention Mozart to the Emperor. Here we see Katarina, Salieri and Schikanida, three people whose faces of sorrow have different contexts depending on the person. For Katarina, we can see that she clearly loved him deeply. For Salieri, he seems both sad and dignified. For Schikanida, it seems as though he thinks he could have given Mozart some more money in order to aid his health, but you can make up your own mind as to what could be going on in their minds. We then cut to a group of people who seem to be far more friendly people in Mozart's life. His wife Constanza, her face almost fully covered, possibly out of shame for leaving him, but mostly just the overwhelming wave of grief she feels over losing him. Constanza's mother having realised that Mozart was having some serious issues, Mozart's son and possibly daughter on the right, though I'm not sure. Mozart had multiple children in real life, so I'm not sure who exactly his children could be in this film. But then seeing Laurel, the maid, having known everything she's been through, everything she's helped with, suspecting she may have helped Salieri to kill Mozart, whatever she is thinking, there is definitely so much guilt here. It's quite strange that we can feel more sorry for her than Constanza. I think there's a lot of nuance in that kind of context. It reinforces the idea that we are seeing this story from the perspective of the wrongdoers. The heavy rain is an oblivious touch, but it makes the scene so much more sadder. And again, you can connect it back to the metaphor of snow. The rain is pouring down and will soon freeze into snow as Salieri's life freezes and is unable to go any higher as he gradually becomes frozen in this state of obscurity, never to be shown as much appreciation as Mozart. Everyone leaves and we slowly watch as it's revealed that while Mozart was a celebrity, he is not being given an honorary grave. The irony is so sad, he's being buried in a pauper's grave, as if he's just one of the commoners. Which is both cruel, as we feel as fans of Mozart, that he should have been given something better as a thanks for the amazing work he did. At the same time, it's something that makes us feel closer to him. Having been basically a pauper towards the end of his life, it cements his legacy as someone who was able to make music that is so relatable to the everyday person. That's just my interpretation. I find a lot of composers make classical music that's relatable to high-class people who simply like classical music, whereas I've always felt more of an array of emotions from Mozart's music that really feels like he is a friend who understands truly how deep and layered emotions actually work, something everyone experiences. So there it is, he is buried, and yes, I have cried during this scene. Whenever I watch it, I just can't stop thinking, he died too early, and it's unfortunate he had to be buried like this. So the lacrimosa comes to an end, ending on a major chord, 
as we see that the priest has lost all grip of reality and has absolutely no idea what to think about anything Salieri has said. It feels as though he's even beginning to question his belief in God, since the God in this story is so confusing and so enigmatic. Notice how it's morning here as well. The priest had been listening to Salieri all night, and again, the morning signifies some sort of clarity. In this last scene, it's still not clear whether Salieri did indeed poison Mozart or not, and we can make up our own minds. I think the core of this film is that actually, it doesn't matter. What matters is the irony of how everything turned out. This God-loving musician, loved by all, but consumed by jealousy, ending up unknown, forgotten, and mentally tormented for years, while Mozart, an immature, irresponsible, incidental genius, barely appreciating his time, driven to an early death, yet his legacy is immeasurable. Really, both scenarios are quite terrifying. To be dead and to have never experienced your work's impact on the world, much like Van Gogh, but also to have lived a long life, still never experiencing satisfaction from your art. Salieri was unhappy even when his music was appreciated because he had enough self-awareness to understand that fundamentally his music just wasn't as good as Mozart's. And the reality of that observation set in as he grew older, driving him to attempt suicide. Instead, he is saved and brought to a mental asylum to be kept alive, continuing to be tormented, which is why these last few moments in the film are so important. Good morning, Professor. Time for the water closet. And then we have your favorite breakfast for you. Sugar rolls. He loves those. Fresh sugar rolls. I will speak for you, Father. I speak for all mediocrities in the world. I am their champion. I am their patron saint. <laughs> This is the point where Salieri has just unlocked some sort of coping mechanism, a delusion. If I can't be a hero in the outside world, I'll just deem myself a hero in this place. And so he does. We see him being wheeled through this asylum, about to be washed, which is a very humiliating thing to go through as an elderly person, mind you. It's as if you are being perceived as a useless baby again. Yet the fact that he is happy tells us he has developed some sort of coping mechanism that has warped his view of the world. Now he is a king. He is the patron saint of mediocrities. He has struggled. He has been through the long life of envy, sadness, and vengeance. He now views himself as a god, or as Jesus. This is what it seems he has always aspired himself to be, since he was a child, loving this god, begging for god to bless him with talent, being denied that talent for it to be given to a buffoon. Salieri then deciding to block God and hate him with every fiber of his being. And now to take his place. Now I am superior in my chamber. It's sad to see him like this. And then to hear this. <laughs> when I saw this at the Royal Albert Hall, there wasn't a laugh there. So I think possibly that laugh isn't in the theatrical version. And I don't understand why. The laugh is so powerful. The fact that even now Salieri has found some way to be happy, even if it's ingenuine, still Mozart haunts him. Even the mere fact that this is a film in the 80s, 200 years later, and still Mozart's more famous and more appreciated than Salieri. Mozart isn't going anywhere. I also feel like in these last few seconds, we notice Salieri's smile fade and his unchanging sadness just comes back before we fade out. That's it, movie over. I was planning on writing a whole final chapter encapsulating everything that's important about this story, but I think the last scene did that all for me, so I really don't think I have much to say. This is such a relatable delve into the most darkest of human emotions that we've all experienced some form of in our lifetime. I feel like it's very human to be able to empathize with the foolishness of Mozart, the jealousy of Salieri, the habits and addictions of Mozart, the hate and anger of Salieri. This is an amazing tribute to the unforgettable art of the best composer. And no, I don't think Salieri was evil in real life. Some people are upset that Salieri is portrayed like this, and I think it's important that people know what's real and what's not. But I think this portrayal of Salieri is more of a case study into evil caused by envy, as opposed to simply exploring Salieri's life. The real Antonio Salieri is more of a placeholder for this deep delve. Not to mention, it's based on the real cries that came from Salieri after he attempted to kill himself. He had dementia, but he still actually did claim to kill Mozart. That's simply 
a good idea for a story, and that's why it was written like this. I don't think this was made to besmirch the real Salieri, it was simply a way to bring attention to this interesting series of events. And this story was told in such a beautiful and seamless way, you barely notice that the main character seems to shift throughout the film, because it's all so natural. It doesn't feel out of place that suddenly we don't see Salieri for a while and now we're experiencing Mozart's life and vice versa. All the performances are so complex, you can connect so easily to so many of the characters, even minor roles like Laurel, Van Sweeten or Bono. Someone had mentioned something that had also occurred to me about Bono. It seems that Bono has a soft spot for Mozart since he is also a composer and he seems conflicted between blending in with his peers and agreeing with this silly composer and so it seems as though he lets others around him decide for him because he is scared to be outcasted. He's more of a sheep, maybe he's another person who was jealous of Mozart, the way he lived his life so freely and how that might have had a great impact on the music he would make. Everyone's relationship with each other, all the dynamics are so real, when we look at it from an economical and psychological standpoint, I feel like this movie has such a modern kind of perspective. As I said before, it doesn't feel like an 80s film, it could easily be a present day Oscar winning film. And that's why Amadeus is one of my favourite movies, if not my favourite movie. It was so great to get to know you all through this analysis, thank you so much for subscribing and being interested in what I want to say, I guess, bye. <laughs>